This is Ken Groots with video number two on Phoenix. Number two. So what we were talking about before was the idea that um, our core principle, the principle of existence, um, can be translated mathematically um, or, or can be given a mathematical language through graph theory and combinatorics um, and also through an idea of networks. And uh, when we speak of networks, just generally, we're speaking of um, nodes that can give information or take in information. Um, and we can translate this, this network concept using a duality transformation that preserves what we call the Euler characteristic, or preserves the topology. We can translate this into um, uh, another domain, the particle domain, um, where um, the information structures that are created have some very important core features. And uh, the, the most important of those core features is that every vertex has three of something on it. And the types of things that those three things can be are that the vertex can be self-connected uh, and it can be self-connected in a positive way or in a negative way. By the way, where that comes from when we go back to the um, the network um, um, the network uh, uh, duality is that when you have two nodes that are talking to each other you might have one node sending a signal this way to a second node or you might have the second node sending a signal this way to the first node. So if you distinguish the signal, the, the, the orientation of the signal flow, then you, you come into the idea of, let's say, a positive signal flow or a negative signal flow. And when you use that concept, then you can translate that in this dual information uh, uh, routine, um, you can translate that into um, a self-connected nature where it's self-connected either in a positive way or it's self-connected in a negative way. And again, we distinguish that in our diagrams by either what looks like a loop or what looks like an arrow. Um, so, uh, so back to the particle information way of looking at this. Um, in this language, those are two of the things that can be connected to a vertex. And the third thing is where you connect an edge to your vertex, and that edge connects to another vertex. So um, this way of describing the basic uh, core features of uh, information flow um, gives us something quite remarkable. What if a single vertex were connected to itself by uh, three times over? So it has three loops hanging on it. Or it has three arrows hanging on it. Um, does that mimic or describe, as I'm purporting, some kind of particle? Of course the answer is yes. But um, but let's take it a step. Let's keep going with this idea. What if instead of having a vertex that's connected to itself three times over, and in point of fact, I just wanted to show you um, what that would look like. So I'm raising to you this, this idea where you have this vertex. See the vertex in the middle? And you see the three loops surrounding it? That's a vertex that's connected to itself three times over. So you can have that object. Um, or you can have this other object, which I also described, which is a vertex, which is connected to itself three times over, but in a, in a, where the flow is going in the opposite direction. Okay? So we have three arrows. And you also, just for the sake of uh, completeness, have two other types of flows. That is to say, you've got one that has one loop and, and sorry, 
has one loop and two arrows, and the other that has two loops and one arrow. Now, all of these preserve that central idea that every vertex has three of something on it. So the, um, the, um, the statement that I make is that these four fundamental entities are particles. But I also want to take it one, I want to keep walking through the steps to show you some very interesting things. So one step further is to ask the question, well, what if I have a vertex that has two loops, but it's connected to another vertex? That's what this, this line represents here. So it basically says that this loop structure can be connected to another vertex. Let's say in this case, a vertex that looks kind of similar to itself. Okay, so you can see that edge actually connects the two. So instead of speaking of the whole system, we only speak of the vertex itself, and we go, okay, well, this should represent something particle-like in this theory if what I'm purporting is true, which is that they are, represent these structures represent particles. Now, we can further ask the question, well, okay, so why would we stop there? What if we created an entity where we have a single loop and then the vertex is connected to two other vertices or another vertex twice over? Okay, and that's what that one represents. And then we have this final concept where the system... Um, really um, is um, a vertex that connects, that has no self-connectedness. So here's that diagram. So we have a vertex which somehow reaches out, fully reaches out uh, to other vertices. So the idea of this three connectedness on each vertex is just represented as, as I've shown, um, can be simply represented um, with these um, with these diagrams, um, and I'm going to just quickly show them again. Uh, in fact, I'm going to quickly show them with a diagram later on. Um, but they, they can be quickly represented with these diagrams. Now, there's something fascinating about what I've just shown you. I mean, there's a lot that's fascinating about it, but one critical thing that's fascinating about it is the idea of charge. One of the things that we learn from quantum chromodynamics, which is the reigning theory um, uh, of um, the strong nuclear force, it's the idea of quarks. These entities, these quarks, are what create the uh, nuclear particles, namely uh, the neutron and the proton, uh, the baryons and the mesons. Uh, so all of the things that really constitute the heart of matter um, are created uh, by this idea of quarks. So one of the always the strangest thing about quarks is that they have fractional charges. Hmm. Now this is not something that we've really seen in nature. When we measure a charge of something, and Benjamin Franklin was well known for, for showing this, uh, as well as many other physicists at his time and before, but when we measure a charge, it always seems to come in a unit quantity. It's either one, or two, or three, or some, you know, negative one, or negative two, or negative three, but some integer quantity. And now, all of a sudden, with quark theory from the 60s, and you know, again, we're still using it, but all of a sudden, with quark theory, we have something strange happening. Now we have particles that have fractional charges, but it's just not any old fraction. Now the charges can be 1, or plus or minus 1, as we as we've talked about before, but they can also be plus or minus 2 thirds, or plus or minus 1 third, or 0. Now, what I've just demonstrated in showing you um, these um, units, uh, these, these graphical units uh, that come out of um, 
that come out of this dual transformation. This, for example. What I'm showing you here is this vertex has three loops on it. Now, I'm also showing you that this vertex right here has only two loops on it, and then something that connects it to another vertex. And then this vertex right here, that's why I can find it very quickly, kind of put them all down, and this vertex right here has only one loop on it, and it's connected to two, two other vertices, or connected twice over to a second vertex. And then finally, this vertex here has no loops on it, okay? So it's fully connected to other vertices, never to itself. Well, this looks remarkably similar to what we were just talking about with those fractional electric charges. If we just say for a second that this guy here, or gal, with three loops on it, is by comparison something different than this one with only two loops on it, we might actually beg to say, well, what if we took the three and divided it by three and just said one, okay? That the charge of this is one, if these loops might represent charge in some strange way. Because on this one, by comparison to this one, the charge would be two-thirds. And then this one here, by comparison to the first one, the charge would be one-third, since there's only one loop here. And then this one, by comparison to the first one, the charge would be zero-thirds. So, in a very strange way, we're sort of led to, to understand these strange structures almost according to this idea that maybe these, these loops um, tell us something about the charge. And if that's the case, then this entity right here, which has three out of three, would have a charge of one. And this structure right here, which has two loops out of three potential loops, would have a charge of two-thirds. And then this structure right here, which has one loop out of three, would have a charge of one-third. And then this structure right here, which has no loops whatsoever, it's just fully connected to other things, has a charge of zero. So it's one of the first remarkable things that seems to fall out of the, 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 um, the structures here, is that we can have an idea of where fractional charges come from for quarks, and how we get structures like an electron, which doesn't have a fractional charge, where it's entirely uh, its own entity. So we would then try to associate this structure right here with an electron. We would then try to associate this structure right here with an up quark. We will then try to associate this structure right here with a down quark. And then we would try to associate this structure right here with some type of energy. Maybe something photonic. But it carries no charge. But it does seem to still be like the other particles. It, it has a vertex. It's connected in some way. So maybe it's some type of energy, pure. Now, what's also interesting is that each one of these diagrams has what might be called an antiversion. So here we have what we're calling an electron, which has three loops. But then we also, as we talked about before, have another type of uh, uh, vertex which instead of having these loops, it has the arrows. So the loops each represent something positive, like a positive one for each loop. 
this would be the opposite. It would be like a negative one for each one of these arrows. So these two things have some sort of relationship such that this one is almost the negative of this one. And so we can try to make an association and ask, is it possible that this is the anti-electron, the positron, the anti-particle of this? Is it possible that when we replace loops with arrows, that what we're really doing is switching, uh, doing a, what we call a charge conjugation. We're switching a particle for its antiparticle. Okay? So if this is the case, then what we've constructed here, what we have here, is within the fabric of this, this network idea, how one has particles and how one has antiparticles so that one can certainly make the association, for example, um, not just of these, um, these uh, electrons and depositrons, but also make the association uh, between the quarks. And, for example, our association between this u-quark is that it has an anti-u-quark, given like this. And the association between the d quark is that it has an anti d quark, namely something that looks like, if I can make it, okay, something that looks like this. Okay, so we have our, we get the, the u quark and the anti u quark. And then our packets of energy. So we have a packet of energy, uh, or a, a chunk of energy that look like this, where it's a vertex connected to all the other vertices, and then we have its anti-chunk of energy. But interestingly enough, it probably it doesn't, you know, it doesn't register in terms of charge that these are anti. But, you know, if one looks at it very closely, one sees that in the one case, information comes into the vertex, and in the other case, information is fully leaving the vertex. So these are anti to each other, and in fact, the information I placed as arrows on the lines. So it's either flowing into the vertex or flowing out of the vertex. So take a look at that again. Okay. So what we've constructed now is not just these particles like the electron. We've not just un in this concept. We've not just created this strange unification between electrons, u quarks, d quarks, and energy. But we've also created their antiparticles, the positron, the anti-up quark, the anti-down quark, and something that looks like an anti-energy, or at least it's still energy. Okay? It's just that the direction of the information flow associated with that energy is in the opposite. Instead of it being a sink, it's a source. So we have this, this beautiful thing going on with these structures, if we're identifying them correctly. And I, by the way, I call this sort of the, the quark-lepton methodology. It's where you look at a graph, and looking at the loop structure of the graph, you identify it with a, a leptonic structure or a quark, excuse me, a quark structure. Um, and so we have this, this association. Now, What's also important in this theory is that when you have a structure um, that needs to connect to another structure, like the d-quark, needs to connect to another structure, this does not form all by itself a particle. Okay, This graph is incomplete. All we're doing is saying that this can this vertex um, uh, looks like this, but is always being connected to a vertex here, most likely, and another vertex over here. So let me give you uh, a, um, a look at, or how that might look. So you have um, so you have that that inner vertex of the D right here connecting to this u quark right here because they can form a line. The information flowing out of here flows directly here, as one can see with the arrows. Um, and conversely, 
On the other side, you can construct, uh, if I can find the right part, um, right here. Okay. You can construct, I'm still not finding the right card, by the way, so that's why uh, I'm, uh, I'm crapping here. Okay. Here we go. On the other side, you can use the similar entity over here, the U quark, and do that. So now we've got our D quark and its edges actually connecting appropriately to, to two other vertices. This is what we call a, a graph. This is actually a particle graph because it connects appropriately vertices to each other. So again, this U quark has to always connect to two things, whereas the U quark, uh, whereas the U quark only has to connect to one thing. Okay, so from this, actually what we've identified with our construction here is the creation of a proton. That, my dear friends, is your first look at the creation of a baryon using this, this system. This is a proton. It's got two U quarks, boom and boom, and one D quark. So through this quark methodology, we can all automatically, boom, create whatever particles we're trying to create. We can also create the neutron from this, from this structure. Uh, and I would uh, encourage the watchers to to, to attempt to create a neutron. Um, but my warning is that you're going to have to throw in another structure. And I'm going to key you in. That structure is a chunk of energy. So our neutron, instead of having three vertices, actually has four vertices to it. So that's an interesting twist um, in order to minimally create the graph. Um, so we've, we've, using this quark methodology, we're able to identify, or that's what the quark methodology is, is to identify what these vertex structures are. And they match up with the idea of what a U quark is, or uh, up quark or down quark um, are. Now, we also uh, have the problem of how do we get these other um, these other structures like mesons. Okay, so we just use the idea of U quark. Um, so I'm gonna take that idea again and let's construct a um, I'm looking for the cards. <laughs> okay, we're gonna construct a meson. And that meson will contain a U quark and an anti U quark. And it looks like this. Okay, so we have our U quark, and if the camera would stop, we have our anti U quark, and you can see that the information flows from one to the other. Of course, you can have it in the opposite way. You can have this structure where the information is flowing back that way. But, but for the concept of being able to to identify a graph with. Um, with a, a particle, um, this is the basic idea here. Um, and so here we've just created a neutral uh, pion or pi meson. Um, and, so, um, and so we can, in fact, construct this. And what we find mathematically, and we're going to get back to the math um, to, to talk about this also in a much more um, uh, technical and relevant way, but this structure um, resonates between this look and another look that you should also already be familiar with from particle theory. But if you're not, it's okay. I understand. Um, so I'm looking for this structure to create it for you. Um, the first part is the D quark. And so I'm looking for the anti-D. And I have found it. Okay. So we have the D quark and the anti-D quark. And if we actually associate the edges, okay, so we've got them associated here, and we know, or we, we should know, that this one connects to this one here. 
So in essence, we have a particle that has a loop on the one side, an arrow on the other side, and two edges connecting them. Okay? It looks a little strange on these cards because you have to wrap this back here. But this entity would be a neutral pi meson made out of D quarks, a D and an anti D. Whereas before we had the neutral pi meson made out of U and anti U. And what you find mathematically is that these two particles actually uh, transform into each other in this theory. Um, in the case of the proton, one of the things that I do want to tell you that is so miraculous, uh, that, that sort of validates that, in point of fact, we are talking about um, the structure and reality we call a proton, and I'm reforming it right here, but this, this version where you've got the two U quarks here and the D quarks here, when you look at how this particle transforms, in Phoenix, this particle does not transform, or rather, it, 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 what it transforms into is essentially the same type of particle. It doesn't break apart. It doesn't decay. Okay? And it doesn't transform in, into anything that measurably looks different than what you're seeing here. In other words, according to Phoenix, according to the math of Phoenix, this particle is stable. Now, another interesting twist on this is that when you form the neutron that I was advocating you guys out there do on your own, um, when you do form that neutron, actually, let me, let, me, let me give you what the neutron really looks like here. Okay, I'm going to draw it out for you. But the neutron, actually, and this drawing is extremely crude, so please... I am an artist, but on the spot with the pen and a piece of paper, I'm not that good. This is what the neutron looks like. Can you guys see that? Okay. So we've got the U quark here. We've got the two down quarks here and here. It's kind of hard to do this. And then you've got this piece of energy, this one right here. Now what's interesting is that in Phoenix, this particle transforms. It actually can break apart into two other particles. And the transformation allows it to break apart. And again, I'm trying to draw on the spot, so forgive me. <laughs> it actually transforms into these two particles. See those particles at the bottom? No, because the camera's not putting it there. Okay. See those two particles at the bottom? We've already identified what this one was. That's the proton. This one is something that we have yet to identify, but if this thing is correct, it should be a W minus particle. Okay? So what we've now figured out is a lot of stuff, but one of which is now we can identify, remember how we had the um, electron and the positron? Remember the electron here and the positron here? And I also just quickly flashed in front of you two other single vertex um, particles okay, that are full graphs. These are full graph particles. They do not need to be connected to any other vertices. So they form their own particles. Well, I also pointed out to you these two, these two particles. Okay? But I didn't identify what they were. Well, now we know what one of them is. From our neutron decay, which brought about the existence of a proton, we also have that it brings about the existence of this particle, which must, if that neutron decay is in fact a neutron decay, this must be a W minus particle, which then means that its antithesis must be a W plus. So, from our work in using this quark methodology of identifying particles, we're now able to conclusively say that this thing looks like a W plus and this thing looks like a W minus. These are the weak nuclear particles at their most basic level. And it comes out in our decay sequence. Now we also know um, that again the proton is stable. So it doesn't decay into anything like this. Um, it doesn't decay. So, um, 
Um, so we've been able to identify mesons, in particular the pi mesons. Um, I haven't demonstrated it to you mathematically, so I'm ask, asking you to accept it on faith right now, that the pi meson made out of a U and an anti-U quark can transform, and only transform, into a pi meson that's made out of a D and an anti-D quark, which transforms into a U anti-U and transforms into... And we see this, this looping transformation in actual particle dynamics, that we actually have to take into account both of these forms of the pi meson if we want to have a more complete understanding of a pi meson. Um, so, um, so we're able to do that, but now we have to ask another important question as we're creating these particles. The next important question is, okay, well we've created baryons, we've created mesons, um, we've created some leptons, but there are still other leptons. Okay, there's the neutrino. What's a neutrino? Okay. And so we know, you and I, because we're particle physicists and we've studied it enough of it to at least know that a neutrino is associated with an electron and associated with a W, um, a w plus. So we know that an electron is involved NAW plus is involved in the creation or in how a neutron works and interacts. It's a weak particle, so that's why the W is involved. But the electron is also there. In particular, we know that a neutrino, uh, when it interacts uh, with a W, um, can form an electron. Another way of saying it is that um, a weak particle decays into a, a neutrino, or rather, a W minus particle decays into an electron plus an anti electron neutrino. Um, and so, what we do in the physics vernacular. Um, Actually, I'm going to cut this short because I want to come back to this on a separate uh, video.